set the pace when I'm running I always take what I want and I always give it 100 Don't need a bank, no I'm funded Play the game like it's nothing I'm always thankful for something Don't take for granted, stay humble Now wake up, it's time to look at the enemy Hi everybody and welcome to my channel In this episode I'm going to be talking about high security prisons Specifically HMP Franklin because a lot of me viewers and subscribers that have seen the Franklin documentary that I'm in, even though I've spoke a lot about Franklin on the early stages of me channel, not so much lately, but a lot of me subscribers have been asking us, could I go into a bit more about what it was like whilst I was in here at GMP Franklin? So that's what I'm going to talk about in this episode. So I'll start off by talking about my first day there and where I came from and where I was obviously going to front and but where I came from, what prison I was getting moved from. <clears throat> so I was in here, HMP Durham, and I'd spent about 10 months in Durham and I was 21 year old at the time. And I got transferred across to here, HMP Franklin, because when you get sentenced in prison, you always, well, you used to, I didn't notice this the last time, you didn't get asked the last time, but what used to happen was, especially if you were long-termer, they would give you three choices of which prison you would like to go to. And at the time, when I was in Durham, you had what was called a life officer, and he took care of everyone that was serving a life sentence or an indeterminate sentence, like myself, IPP. And <clears throat> you had to pick three choices, but I said, well, I don't want any other choices. I just wanted to go to Franklin because Franklin wasn't far from here, HMP Durham. I'm from Durham, County Durham. So it made sense for me to be housed over there because that is going to be easier for visits and everything. Obviously, being from the local area, you meet lads that are from the local area and you all get, get together and become friends with people who are from the same area as you. So, but there was two other options. I mean, option two and three was... Goff and um, what was the other one? Sorry, um, Loudham Grange. I was going to say a long lot in there. Loudham Grange, because I was a cat B, um, you can pick either cat A as cat, Franklin is a cat, category A slash B. It's a dispersal prison which holds category A prisoners and category B. But I remember on association in Durham when I said to one of the screws, I says, uh, Can you check when I'm going to Franklin? One of the lads shouts over, he says, fucking hell, you for real? You want to go to Franklin? I said, well, yeah, of course I want to go there. They were looking at us like that as if I was crazy. The one the day over there, there was there was a four of us got transferred over. Um, and we were in the waiting room, in the reception, in the holding cell, when you go through. And like I mentioned on the Franklin documentary, on the walls, just like a wall up behind us, it had inscribed on, welcome to hell. But the feelings I was getting, I was like, because I sort of wanted to go to prison, but well, I did want to go to prison from a young age because of the mindset that I was in and getting to Durham and then getting to HMP Franklin was like getting getting to the top of the chain in the prison system. It was sort of in my head, it was felt as if it was like a badge of honor that you've getting to the highest security prison in the country, maximum security prison, you aim with the big timers. So I'm thinking that I've made it because I'm actually in Franklin. What are I um, Not until I, I've gotten older and realised when I look back now how daft of a thought that actually was. But I'm here to tell me story. And when I seen that on the walls, welcome to hell, I was excited. I was anxious. All different types of emotions. But... I wasn't scared. I wasn't worried. And when I was looking at the other lads that were in reception with us, and I could see the fear on their faces, and sometimes when I get nervous, it makes us laugh. And when I'm looking at these lads, like I always remember the reason why I was looking down because one of them was lying on the, he was lying on the floor. There was no spaces left on the benches. He had his hands behind his head on the floor, just looking up, looking around. And I could see how nervous he was, so I started chuckling away. And he'd look at us like, I just have to see what you're laughing at. And I just couldn't help this laughter. So, <clears throat> anyways, the screws come down after they searched us all. Said, right, we're going up to the wings. And all of us that were there, we're all getting put on the same wing together. We got put on F-wing in front and prison. And on your way up, 
It's all just metal fences, cages all the way up, barbed wire up the top, everywhere you walk. Proper, you can tell you're in a maximum security prison. The screws standing every so so far up with guard dogs on the um gets to the wing. So you walk on the wing and you meet every different type of prisoner in them sort of prisons. Um gangsters, hitmen, murderers, serial killers. You name it, it was in there. So I've walked on the wing, and obviously some of the lads knew that I was arriving at the prison because my dad was in that same prison. So they were expecting us because my dad had got told earlier on in the day of one of the um of one of the screws that your son was coming. So he told the lads on the wing who we knew because my dad was actually going to work that day in the workshops. So when I come walking on the wing, a couple of the lads come up saying, Oh, you must be Ricky. Um, they took us in the pod, came in, gave us a high five, gave us bits of food, sort of welcomed us in, said, listen, you'll be fine here. Just keep your head down, get on with your jail. You'll be all right. And in that prison, like I've mentioned, is some of the biggest gangsters come out of this country that's ever come out of this country. And, <clears throat> and I was in amongst all these. And like I've just mentioned, I wasn't scared. I was more excited. Although I was anxious, I've always had a bit of anxiety, but I was also excited, excited to be in there, meeting all these different people. And again, leading back to my mindset, that was the mindset I was in, and that was what I wanted at that age. Looking back, it's a fucked up thing to want, but that's what I wanted, and that's what I got, and that's what I was living. But I'll just tell you some of the people that I met whilst in there some of the acts of violence and the dynamics of the prison and the layout. I'll tell you about the layout of the prison, first of all. So the door that I mentioned when you come walking through, you walk through the door and it's a big open wing and you've got the ones on the bottom, the ones and then the twos. There's only two landings in that jail, in that wing, sorry. So you're walking through and you've got pads down either side on the bonds and the twos. And I think there was about... 20 on the bottom, 20 on the top, on either side, or maybe it's 25. There was between 80 and 100 prisoners on the wing. So you had about between 40 and 50. I can't remember exactly how many cells there was on this side. Then you go down, you've got the screws center office in the middle. So that's that part of the wing. And then it got branches off into an L shape. So you've got like an L shape, and then you've got the other side, the other spur to F wing. And that's where I went on to on the other side. And that was the layout of the prison. And on the end of each spur, down on the ones, actually, on your first one, on it was up on the twos, you've got the kitchen on this side. And when you went onto the other side of the wing, on the left, on the other side of the spur, the kitchen was on the bottom. And that was the kitchen that I was in that I've mentioned on the documentary and I've mentioned previously. So the ones that are new to me channel, I'll just tell you, because the ones that have been following us from the start, I've heard this story a few times. But the second day that I was in there, I was in this kitchen. I was bearing in mind in high security prison in, in the dispersals. You can cook your own food. You can walk in and they had three cookers with ovens, all the hot plates on the top. You can make toasties or you can go in. They've got big freezers, big chest freezers. Got a fridge freezer for your salad. Fridge freezer for all your meat because you can buy full chickens, you can buy steaks. But that's only if you've got money to fend for yourself. Otherwise, if you didn't have a job in prison and you were on £2.50 wages a week, you wouldn't have had enough money to live that sort of luxury. So that was only for people that more, more or less had money that were getting it sent in on the outside or they were making money in prison, either through selling contraband or the jobs that they offered in prison. On the second day, I was in that kitchen and there was a pan of hot oil bubbling away and me and me pal that was in the kitchen cooking a steak, looked over and seen the pan and looked at each other and thought, well, that seems a bit odd. Something seems to be going to be happening. And just as I said that, the lad come walking in, picked the pan up, went up behind the bloke that was standing and washing these dishes. And the bloke that was standing and washing these dishes was Darren Barrett, who was head of the Al-Qaeda in the UK, a terrorist. And he went up behind him 
poured the hot oil over his head and you just seen his hair peeling off and his hair, his skin just dripping down the back of his head and Darren and this other fella, Jamaican bloke, both went after the lad that done it, went in the pad and sort of had a scuffle with him. But um, the tension on the wing after that, bearing in mind this is my second day experience in this prison, and the tension after that was like, you could cut it with a knife, it was unbearable, the tension, like all the Muslim lads were getting together and it was as if they were going to plot revenge. And the lad that done it, obviously, there was cameras on the wing, I'm not sure, or they might have just getting cameras on the wing at the time. He actually got escorted off and took down the block, so he wasn't on the wing anymore. But it still felt as if something was going to happen. The area, the, the area, or the prison, and the atmosphere, sorry, not the area, the atmosphere in the prison was very volatile. And you were just waiting for something to happen at any given moment. But it seemed to quieten down after a week or two. Everyone started feeling a bit more relaxed and getting back to their daily routines and just doing what they're doing and not having to watch the back because a lot of the Muslim lads that were on the wing got on with everybody else and they knew there was nobody else involved. So the, the situation did not escalate any further at that point. But there was one other fella on the wing, Omar Kayam, who was another terrorist, and I think he was involved with the was it the dirty bomb plot, I think it was described as down in London. He was feeling vulnerable because he was the only one left on the wing at the time, a terrorist that is. So he took it upon himself to get a pan of hot boiling oil and come out and walk down the wing and go up behind um Malacrudus, a lad from Gateshead and tip this pan of oil over his head, and his head just ballooned up double the size, and he got took off to hospital. <clears throat> so he went up behind Mala, tipped it over his head, head blew up like a big balloon, and he got took off to hospital. And he only had a couple of months left on his sentence. He'd been in for quite a long time. He'd, uh, he was in for on Robbie, I think, doing a 10 or a 15, something like that along them lines. And he didn't have long left on his sentence. He had a few months and this unfortunate event happened to him just before he was due to be released. And he spent a long time in hospital before he come back and went on the hospital wing. But Omar Kayam, who got took off the wing immediately, was put down into segregation. He said that he felt vulnerable and he felt like he was going to become under attack. So he'd done this just to get moved off the wing. Instead of just going to the screws and saying, put us down the block, I want to be moved, I want to get into another prison or something, um, he went and done this just so he get moved off the wing. But he probably has also done it as a bit of retaliation for his friend because obviously his friend he come under attack. This has happened to him. He's maybe he's wanted to show martyrdom and show that he's done something in response. So, uh, But again, the atmosphere was volatile after that. Well, it's, it's calmed down after a few weeks. And <clears throat> I've spent three years in that prison and I'll just tell you about a few more of the people that were in that prison that a lot of you maybe have heard about on other prison channels or you'll have heard about them because of the high profile. But I'll speak about Kevin Lane first because a lot of you know Kev. He's doing podcasts all the time. He's got a book out, Fitted Up and Fighting Back, and he's still fighting his murder case. Kevin Lane was fitted up for uh, a hit. Someone took a hit out on another fella and Kev got the blame for it and he got a 20-year life sentence. And Kev's fought his way through the system. Everybody who's ever been in a high-security prison knows who Kevin Lane is because he had a fearsome reputation and he didn't take any prisoners, so to speak. He fought with the screws all the time whilst he first came in because on the out before prison, Kev was a good boxer. So something, a skill like that, being able to box and being in prison goes a long, long way. Because even though a lot of people use tools in prison and they don't care whether someone can have a fight or not, if you can fight and fight the biggest and the hardest names in the system, you're going to get yourself a big name like Kev did. And people are going to be wary of you and people won't want to mess with you. And that's what Kev had behind him. 
And even when the screws used to try and bully and intimidate Kev in the early days, Kev used to retaliate and fight with the screws. And he spent a lot of his time in the segregation units. So when I met Kev on the wing, he was a, he was a very pleasant chap. He was always making people laugh. He liked to be center of attention, not in a, in a bad way, but he liked to be center of attention. He liked people to be laughing at his jokes because he was he's very witty, very funny, as you can see by his podcasts. And he is a very likable chap. So a lot of people got on with Kev. And he went about his time when I was there because he'd been in a long time by the time I was there. Um, so Kev was sort of settled. He was just building on his case, working on his case all the time. And he did used to have a few parties on the hooch and he used to like getting drunk. But apart from that, Kev never seemed to bother anyone and he never caused anybody on unintentional grief. But um, yeah, so on to the next one. What I'm going to do here is just picture where my pad was because my pad was on the bottom of the wing on the second off end and there was a lad next door to me, Kyle. Um, he used to love his drugs. Couldn't get through his sentence without his drugs but he was also a likeable chap and everyone got on with him. He didn't really bother anybody. I, um, he didn't rob people for his drugs. He had money sent in and he also worked in the kitchens. So all his spare money went on drugs and he didn't, he's not one of these that got debted up unless he did after I got, after I was released from there. But he always paid his way, paid his drugs, paid his drug debts, and he never got no bother. People like Kyle used to get on all right in prison, didn't matter whether he used drugs or not. That was their way of getting through the sentence. So everyone to their own. On the uh, opposite him, you had Abel, a lad from Sunland. He was another, uh, he was always into his fitness. He loved training all the time. Very fit. And he, um, he was always on the, the rowing machines. He was quite a strong lad as well. But I um, just thought I'd mention them too because they were quite close to me and them uh, in that proximity in the pods. I used to speak with them. But um, another one is Peter O'Toole, who was in front with me at the time. And he is also a convicted hitman. And he got on well with Kev. Kev and, Kev, um, Kev and Peter were very good mates. So Peter O'Toole was a very charismatic character as well. He was very witty. He used to make people laugh. And they, um, again, he was another one that used to get through his time by being witty making jokes, making people laugh. And he was another one that used to like training. He was a uh, fanatic about it. He used to go every day. And I was actually on the food boat with Peter. And a food boat is, I'll explain it like this. A food boat is when a lot of you, see you've got five or six of you, that all get together, chip in a bit of money in your canteen, order a load of food. So you've got enough meals to cook for the week because we didn't really eat the prison food because it wasn't the best. So on a night time, we would take turns at cooking food. So we cook steaks, cook chicken, cook one of the lad that was in there. He used to cook the chicken, rice, and peas. And yeah, just food like that. So there was a lot of food that I actually sampled in Franklin that I had never even eaten or eaten on the outside. I was eating better in there than what I was out here, believe it or not. But yeah. Um, yeah, Peter was doing a, a 30 year sentence, life with a recommendation of 30 years for, well, he got convicted as being a hitman. And Peter actually done three years on remand, waiting to go up on trial. I think he had one trial and had a hung jury, went for his second trial, got found guilty. And he got sentenced there and then, but the judge actually turned around and said, that three years that you've just done doesn't count your sentence so it's from today. Give him a minimum of 30 years before he's eligible for parole. So the three years he just done for nothing. So they might as well have given him a 33. It was a 33-year sentence, really, that he's getting. But um, Peter was on the run over in Costa del Sol before he come back and got convicted on these murders. And when Peter was over in the Costa del Sol, he was there, he was involved with a few people over in the Costa del, 
and he was out partying all the time, fighting with the doorman and different things. And when he's come back, he's actually been wanted on an attempted murder and a murder over in well, over in Spain. So when he was in Franklin, they took him down to, I think it was Long Lawton. Was it Long Lawton? I'm not quite sure. He got took to another prison and then he got extradited over to Spain to face these charges. Now, Peter was actually buzzing about going over to Spain because he was thinking about he's going to get conjugal visits. He's going to he's going to be out in the exercise yard when the sun's blaring down on him. And he was thinking he was going on a bit of a holiday, escaping from the UK prison system, going over to Madrid because it was a Madrid prison that he went to. And he was thinking that he was going to go over there and have a holiday. Well, he was actually very, very wrong because when he got there, there was helicopter support, air yeah, armed response, flew him straight from, well, not flew him, but escorted him from the airport, armored vehicle, straight to Madrid prison, put him straight in solitary confinement and left him rotten in there, not seeing any deal like whatsoever. Um, waiting for the trial. But when he went up for the trial, it actually got kicked. And he was there for a few months, two or three months, I believe. I can't remember exactly the details because it was a while ago and I spoke to him about it. So he got um, he got knocked, but no, it was not good. He got choked, sorry, the case got kicked. There wasn't enough evidence. So he got flown back to the UK and I think he ended up back in Franklin prison. And Apart from getting the case kicked whilst he was there, which was a bonus for him, he didn't get his holiday. He got put in the segregation and he said it was horrendous, rat-infested cellar um, with a tiny little hole for some daylight. And he never got on the yard. He never got any conjugal visits. And uh, But yeah, that was Peter, Peter O'Toole. The baby fierce assassin is what he's called in the papers. So if you go on to Google him up, you'll see what he's in for, uh, what he's all about, sorry. Um, so who else can I see on the wing? I'll mention uh, Sharpie, who I've also mentioned before. And uh, I've actually seen Sharpie getting done in. Because when Sharpie first came on the wing, and Sharpie is Paul Sykes' son, by the way, those of you that don't know the ones that haven't seen the videos that I've done previously. And Sharpie, my first impressions were him when I've seen him. I'm a big lad, but he came on. And I think he might have been a year or two older than me. I was 21 at the time. He was 23, I believe. And he was an absolute animal. And when I say animal, I mean the way he looked. He was 20. Actually, I might be getting mixed up because I remember. He was 23, but I think he was 21 or 22 stone as well. And he was an absolute hench, hench of a bloke. But uh, he was going around, once he got settled in on the wing, he was going around taxing people and taking liberties on people. And when you're doing that sort of thing in a high-security prison that's surrounded by murderers, gangsters, hitmen, people aren't going to tolerate seeing this sort of behaviour in a high-security prison. So not long after that, he might have been on the wing about six to 12 months and some lad came up behind him and stuck a chilli, a coffee jar full of chilli powder. But the coffee jar had actually been smashed on the top, so it was all jagged. And they come up behind him and rammed it in his neck and twisted it. And I remember Sharpie just turned around and went, Ugh! and he went running down the landing after him. This lad was like a third of the size of Sharpie. And Sharpie's just pulling down the landing towards him, chased him down onto the ones and he went and run in the mock cupboard, in the cleaning cupboard, shut the door of the lad, and Sharpie came pegging it down, chasing after him. And the screws just stood in the way, because they must have known what was happening. They could sense something was happening on the wing, and they were just waiting for it, because everyone was on edge, because people heard about what was going to happen. And the screws just stood in front of Sharpie. They wouldn't let him get past, and they just walked him off the wing, blood pissing out of his neck. And everyone was out on the railings. I remember looking down and everyone was hanging over the railings. Everyone was clapping the horn, shouting, boo, get off the wing, you big bully. So that was the end of Shorty from what I've seen in that prison. He then went on to strange ways, I think, not long after that. And he got done in, in that prison as well.
got served up pretty bad in that jail as well. But um, another, I'll just talk about some of the incidents that I've seen. Um, I've seen Davy Fields, a lad from down Middlesbrough. Um, he was a fitness fanatic as well. He was a very good, very good friends with Warren Slaney. Warren Slaney was over on J-Wing at the time. So um, Davy Fields had been in about 20 years at this point when I met him. He was in the gym constantly. He was the gym orderly. And he was very, very fit. He didn't eat the cleanest of food either because he, he he lived off the servery food, Davy. And I used to see him coming back with big tree because some of the other lads that didn't eat off the servery food would say, oh, Davy, do you want my tea? So Davy would get two or three man's teas, keep some for later on on his pad. We used to get chips on a weekend, on a Friday or Saturday, and... David could have just been out on the yard doing a circuit for an hour non-stop dripping and he would be coming in and you'd just see him walking back from the survey with a big plate of chips. But he could afford to eat like that because he trained that hard. And uh, if you train that hard, it doesn't matter what you eat. You're still going to look in good shape and you're still going to be fit. So, um, but Davy Fields actually got attacked whilst in front and he got, he got, uh, he got severely beat up off there was three lads all together i'll not go into the full details of it but the one lad come up the land and davy had been saying something to him and he was looking up at davy davy was up on the twos he was down on the ones and he shouted up shouted something back and davy said well come on then and the lads just ran down the land and ran up the stairs come booling down towards him and he's picked them up rugby tackled him just pulled him on his head Smashed him off the floor. He's out on the floor, not clean out. And another lad come running over who was sitting on the phone, come running over, stamped all over him. And another one joined in. So with three of them. And I've seen Davy a few days later. He'd been to the hospital and he had a visit with his girlfriend who'd stuck by him throughout his sentence. And we seen Davy coming through because he brought they brought him from the hospital wing and he come past the visitors there, waiting area. And he looked at us. And he was shuffling along. His head, his face was just black and blue. I've never seen a face like it. Um, and yeah, he got really, really uh, beat up on that time. But Davey was there. Uh, I think he was doing a life with a recommendation of 20 years um, for a shooting down in Middlesbrough. But Davey, when I first came on the wing, you always, you always hear about who the, the characters are and who the who the top dogs are, so to speak. And Davy was one of the ones that people used to speak about because when Davy first went in on his 20-year life sentence, it was 20 or 25, I think it was 20. When he first went in, he was on the unit in Durham and he somehow smuggled a gun into the prison. I don't know how he had it or how he got it in there, but he was actually found with a little gun, a little one-shot gun, on the unit in Dur in Durham, when they used to have the Cardia unit in there. So that that story and that reputation followed Davy. But Davy used to fight his way through the system, and he was a hard bloke, and he was best pals with Warren Slaney, like I've just mentioned. But uh, yeah, yeah, um, who to who I'll talk about next. <clears throat> I'm just going to pick a few random people that keep popping in my head, but there was another fella, Michael. I was going to look him up. I'll tell you what, I'll look him up and do another video on Michael. But Michael was a big bloke. He was about the same height as me. But he was about in his 50s when I met him. He had glasses on, grey, long grey hair. And he was in for important importation of huge quantities of cocaine. And he was he had his own sailing boat and he was actually transporting it in when he got caught and he was doing something like a 30-year sentence for class A drugs. It wasn't a life sentence. It was like a 30-year sentence where you would have done half of it. But I've now found out since I left Frankland a number of years back, um, he got cancer and he actually passed away whilst he was in prison. But I will look him up and I will do another video on him and tell you the full story on him. But he was a he was a character. He kept himself to himself. He was in the, I think he was in the yard class because I was in the yard class, and he used to be in there as well. And he was a quiet chap. 
he spoke quite posh. If you seen him, you would never have thought he was. If you seen him on the outside, you would never guess that he would be that type of person, or or he looked as if he would be a prisoner that would end up in prison. And uh, he was he was intelligent. He was articulate, and like I've mentioned, he, he just kept himself in his small little circle. But I remember one day he came down to me pad. Because I used to write poetry in prison. That's just another thing I might put on my channel. If you do want us to share it, let us know in the comments. On this, um, in prison, you've got a, what's called Inside Times newspaper. And you can send your poems into the paper. And you get like store poem of the month out of all the prisoners in the country. And one of the poems that I put, put in actually won store poem of the month. I think you get £20 or something like that as well for it. And the poem is called... Who said what? I remember it. And it was quite quite a good poem. I'll actually put it up on my community page. And uh, Michael come down, come on me pad, and shook me hand, said, yeah, very good poem out because it was uh, it was talking about prisoners. And one of the one of the verses was Who said prisoners are treacherous louts? Not all no. Who said prisoners are down and outs? Not all prisoners are treacherous louts. And I think that was what he liked that bit of the poem because referring to himself, he looked at himself as he wasn't like a treacherous lout. Even though he was in for what he was in for, he seen himself as not like other type of prisoners where they're taking drugs all the time and robbing people and different things because there is different types of prisoners and different classes of prisoners. I just thought I would mention him because he popped into my head. But Warren Slaney, like I've mentioned, everyone knows, even people that haven't been to the high security prisons have known of Warren Slaney because Warren Slaney is one of the biggest names in the high security estate. You'll be getting on now because he's been in 30 odd years. And again, um, this is for another a murder that apparently he didn't commit. Um, I think it was called the Hot Dog Wars. He got done for murder, and he got a recommendation of twenty odd years. He's now been in thirty odd years, something like that. And Warren was on uh, G Wing when I was in there, and I met Warren in the gym, spoke to him a couple of times. But Warren was one of them type of people that you wouldn't just talk to anybody. He always had a serious look on his face like that. And he would just go into the gym, get his gym done. And like I've mentioned, he didn't really speak with many people. He had his own little circle. But Warren Slaney had the biggest name in the cut years as the hardest bloke. That no one would mess with him. Um, there was a fella that was in there from up this way who had a big name. And Warren put it on him one day and he just didn't want nothing to do with it. So that was the type of person he was. And he wasn't even that... Big people would think he's a big six foot four, 20 stone bloke. He wasn't, he was about five, five ten and about 13, 14 stone, but he was extremely fit. And I think he had a boxing background as well. <clears throat> and he was also a game as toast, he would fight anybody. And I think he was dangerous with a weapon as well. Um, because Kev Lane, I seen on a podcast once when he, he had to talk him down once because Warren had a chiv and he was going to go after somebody. So that was the type of reputation that preceded him. Um, a couple of the other fellas on G-Wing, I mentioned Andy Shack. He was from Skelmersdale. I've, I always thought he was from Liverpool, because I saw the same, had a um, sport like a scouser. So I thought he was from Liverpool, but he's from Skelmers. And he was doing 20-odd wreck for a shooting down in, well, Skelmers, I was going to say Liverpool. But down that way, but Andy Shack was another one. Um, he's one of those characters, lively, typical scouts that always jumping around, hyper is out, um, telling telling jokes, telling stories, everyone laughing at him. He was walking around with a 30 grand watch on in the prison and would just leave it on the windowsill in the prison gym whilst he was training. And he had a massive reputation as a fighter, one of the hardest blokes in there. And not many people would mess with him either. Um, but... Um, yeah, I just thought I would mention Andy because he's another big name. And the other fella who was on G-Wing, who I met down the gym as well, was Colin Gunn. And his brother was in there as well, Dave. Both 
both uh, both decent chops, both got on with the majority of people in prison. I never seen them have any trouble whilst I was in there. Not that they would have trouble, but I didn't see them giving anyone any trouble. Like I've mentioned, they got on with everybody. They've done the jail the right way, getting on with people. But he, um, he, uh, he was doing a 35 rec, Colin, recommendation of 35 years for two murders. But um, Colin Gunn was a massive name in the system. Um, he was not, I don't know the exact type, but he was around about six foot four. He was a massive unit of a bloke. And one of the other lads that was on F Ring with me was his co accused, which was John John. Was it John John? No, it was there. John John or John I. John John or John Joe. I can't remember exactly now. It was that long ago when I was in there. <clears throat> he had a picture up on his wall of Colin, and Colin was leaning against his car, and his private number plate was Power. And they, because uh, Colin Gum was from Nottingham, and he used to run that city down there. Yeah. Not many people would mess with Colin. He was a massive name in the system. But again, like I said, he was like he was a gentleman in prison and he got on with everybody. So he didn't really have any trouble whilst he was in there. Um, but I just wanted to mention and talk about a few names that people might have heard of or people know and just talk about the different type of characters that were in there. But uh, there wasn't just all big gangsters like this that were in there. There's like serial killers. There's Hitman. Yeah, one of them I've done a video on him before. I mentioned him who was called Malcolm Green. And he looked like Malcolm Green. I'm just going to rhyme this. Ed Gein. Here's me portly coming in. <laughs> Malcolm Green looked like Ed Green. But yeah, Malcolm was doing life without parole for killing two tourists. Or was it two tourists? He, I think he'd done two, two murders. On one of them, he chopped the body up and dismembered it and put it in a different bins and across the city. He was from Wales, a Welsh fella, and he looked like a horrible little fucker. He was, he had a bit of a limp when he walked, and he just looked like he had a twitch in his eye, and you could just tell by looking at him that he looked like a, well, like exactly what he was, a serial killer. I think he'd done a murder previously, got out, and then committed another one or two. I've done a video on him before. If you go on my playlist section and go and have a look in the playlist and go down Malcolm Green, Life Without Parole, you will see him. Um, just thinking of my head. Thinking off the top of my head, who else? Um, Gary Nelson was actually in there. He was only on the wing a matter of weeks, maybe it's a couple of months whilst I was there. And Gary Nelson is another massive name in the Catia system, in the high securities well, Gary was from down London and he was doing, I think he was serving life with a 30, at least a 30, I think it was a 30 or 35. And uh, if I remember rightly, I'm sure it was for killing the police officer. But uh, <clears throat> I'll look into that as well. I'll probably do another single video on Gary. But well, Gary was arch enemies with Warren Slaney. Gary Nelson was a black fella from down London. So it was like, Gary and um, Warren, it was like white versus black. They were hating each other. And uh, that did cause a bit of racial divide among some people in their system when they, uh, some people that were friends with Gary and some people that were friends with Warren. It was like black versus white. Um, so it was a lot of friction between them. And when Gary come on to F-Wing, Warren was over on J-Wing. And I remember one day I was out on the exercise yard and they were both shouting each other through the fence and they were arranging to meet up down the gym to have a fight with each other. But um, that never happened because Gary ended up getting moved because of an altercation on the wing. And uh, I thought I would mention Gary because he was a massive name in the system, or he still is. Like I've mentioned, you've got Warren and you've got Gary, who've both got massive names. They're feared and respected throughout the system. Um, so that's why I've mentioned him. Um, another one that popped into my head that was around the corner. I've also done a video on him previously. He's not far from where I live, or that's where the murder happened. And that is Paul Weddle. Paul Weddle was in for killing a police officer, and he was doing life with a recommendation of it was either twenty or twenty-five, and. <clears throat> 
he'd actually done 20 years whilst I was there. I think he's done 30, over 30 years now. So Paul had been in 20 years then. But again, Paul, when you looked at him, you would never, you wouldn't have him down or you wouldn't look. He doesn't look like a cop killer. And when I say that, I'm talking like when you've got the likes of David Bieber, who was another one that was in front when I was there. He was a cop killer, but he actually looked like a cop killer. He was an evil looking man. His eyes were just black. He looked like a shark. He had shark eyes. And he was a dangerous looking man. He was a dangerous man. He killed a police officer. He was wanted in the States for possibly murder over there. And he killed this police officer on Boxing Day. He had him down on his knees and he shot him point blank range in the head when he was pleading for his life. So he was another person that I met whilst in there. But getting back to Paul Weddle, he didn't look like your average cop killer looking fella. He was quite chubby, had glasses on. He was quiet. He got through his sentence by getting off his head all the time. And again, he didn't cause anybody any trouble apart from when he wasn't paying his debts and his budgie got killed because in them prisons you allowed little pet budgies. And Paul's budgie got the short end of the straw for Paul not paying his debts. He'd been in the show one day and he's come back with his pad and he looks in the corner, his cage is open, the bird's not there. He looked down the toilet and its head had been pulled off and choked down the toilet. But yeah, that was just a bit of a warning to him to get his bills paid. Otherwise, it would have been his head coming off because that's what happens in them sort of prisons. They don't mess around with you. They might give you a warning like that with a budgie. But um, if, if someone's going to come after you in them prisons, they're going to come after you and take you out properly. And I'll just talk about another violent offence that happened whilst I was in there. This was a lad that was on G-Wing, but F and G used to walk back from the workshops together. And as we were walking back from the workshops, a couple of the lads said, watch what's going to happen here. So a lad that was further up ahead owed money for a drug debt, and he got paid off another lad on another wing to do this hit on him on the walkway. And he had a big spike, which was about six inches long metal spike, and he went running up the walkway, stuck it in his neck, and just kept on running, running past. The load was pissing out of his neck, and he didn't even know what had went on. The lad had took off back to the wing, and he was on that wing, so the lad didn't even get caught for it. He went back to the wing, ended up getting took off to hospital, but that was because he didn't pay his drug debts, and that's how dangerous it is in these type of prisons. I'm also telling these stories to let the younger lads know what they're getting themselves in for if they're going to get into trouble in out here. Because when you land in them prisons, you know shit is real when you're in amongst people like this, terrorists and hitmen and people that will won't think twice about taking out one of your eyes or stabbing you in the neck. So you might think they're big and hard out here, think you're a big G, but see how big of a G you are when you're in amongst real Gs. Um, Willie Moore, I'll mention him, from Liverpool. He's a massive name out here in Liverpool. And he was doing 30-year life with a recommendation of 30-year for murder. Um, Willie was a typical scouser. He was uh, he got on with most people. Willie was there. Uh, he was all right. Kept his cell, his cell. Had his own little crew. Yeah, uh, Willie was actually on my food boat with us. We used to cook a bit of food. Not that Willie cooked much, because Willie was working on the servery, serving the food, and he didn't really... Wait, I don't even think I remember Willie cooking him food whilst I was in there. I remember his favourite meal was uh, lamb chops. He used to suck the fat off them and fucking chew on it. He used to love it. <laughs> he loved his food, Willie. Yeah. But again, Willie, when I first met him and people was telling us, who he is, what he was in for. He was a he was a multi-millionaire um, from Liverpool. And he was in for, like I've just mentioned, a murder for a shooting. And uh, he had glasses. And when you look at him, he didn't, he didn't look like your typical gangster, your typical hard man, your typical multi-millionaire scouser. But again, he, uh, he didn't take no shit. And I remember when he had a fight one day, when I'm seeing a fight, there was some other scouts that playing the music loud. And Willie used to like the music quiet on a night time so he'd get to sleep early. Because a lot of lads in them prisons go 
go to sleep, they've got a set routine. You get to sleep nine o'clock at night or maybe it's half nine and you're up at five or five in the morning. So some of the lads have got hi-fis, which are like 200 watt speakers. And when they've got these blasting on at night time, even if you're on the other side of the wing, all you can hear is woom, 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 the vibrations coming through your pad. So if you're trying to get to sleep, this is going to drive you insane. So Willie had been shouting out the door, turn the fucking music down, lad. The lad didn't turn his music down. So when Willie's come out in the morning, he's flew across to set about the lad and the vendor having a bit of a scuffle on the landing. Um, and that was uh, that was Willie Moore. But I'll talk about another scouser, where it was Will Coswell. Yeah, he was he's called Richard Coswell, but he gets called Will. He used to go call him Will Young because of his resemblance to Will Young, the singer. And Will was your typical scouser, hyper as fuck, but also could have a fight as well. And he used to, he was loud, he was jumping around the wing, it was like hyperactivity, ADHD type, <laughs> but hyper as fuck, always cracking on with the lads, because them scousers have got a a fucking mad way about them. They're all hyper, they're all loud, they don't give a fuck. The game is toast. Will used to bounce about the wing and he wasn't asked about anybody. And he, uh, he was doing, I think he was doing 18 years at the time for blowing up cars and busy stations. I think he was, I don't know the exact ins and outs. I just remember off what I got told whilst I was in there off through speaking with him and speaking with other people. But Will was a, he was on a campaign across Liverpool of putting bombs in cars and different things, blowing cars up. I think he blew a nightclub up, and I'm sure there was something to do with the police station as well. So his sentence was 18 years, but back then you had to do, it was two-thirds of the sentence, so he had to do a massive stretch of his sentence. But I've actually just seen him in the paper a couple of days ago. He's back in doing another eight-year sentence, um, and he's back in Franklin prison as I speak. So it's a bit, uh, bit ironic how I'm actually speaking about him, about when I was in Franklin with him. And he's actually sitting back in there now doing an eight-year sentence. Uh, but like I've just mentioned, I've just come across it. He was in the paper a couple of days ago. Well, I will. Game is toast. He could have a fight, and he wasn't asked about anybody. <laughs> but um, I think I've covered a lot about the different type of people in Franklin Prison whilst I was there. But um, I will do a part two to this if you want to, if you are interested in hearing about any more people that I was in there with, because these are just a few of the people that I've picked off the top of my head that I've spoke about that I, that was in there whilst I was there. And uh, if you want it, I can do a part two talking about who else was in there. But... um. Again, I was spent about three years in there myself, and I'd done a couple of courses while I was there. I'd done a bricklaying course. I'd done a drug and alcohol course, a six-month intense drug and alcohol course whilst I was in there, and I was training. In my spare time, I was training all the time. This is where I got fanatical about me training. I got, I got as strong as I could be, then I got as fit as I could be. But then I tried to mix them both up. I was doing weighted circuits. And uh, my mindset become a lot clearer whilst I was in there because I come to terms with the sentence I was doing. I come to terms with who I was as a person and I wanted to better myself. And it was only me that had the capability of doing that. So that's what I'd done whilst I was in there. Doing everything in my power to better myself. I used prison to my advantage to do all these different courses, get into the gym, get as fit as possible and I became fit both physically and mentally and my outlook on life became a lot more different. My future wasn't prison, my future wasn't violence, my future wasn't the way it used to be. I wanted the bright things for my future and that's everything that I'm doing now. I'm living my best life but I'll leave that one there for now, people. I've went on for quite a bit. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you would have enjoyed listening to that. But if you are enjoying the content, people, remember to like and subscribe. Take care.